All right, good morning, guys. Um, nice to see you. So we're continuing with the phytochemicals. We're on part two. And so this section revolves primarily around polyphenols, uh, certain phenolic compounds, which includes polyphenols, uh, simple phenolics. There's several essential oils in this category. As I mentioned before, there can be some overlap with the terpenoid section we talked about. And some of these will appear in resins and uh, latex and things like that. Um, but this is uh, a big group of compounds that covers even some compounds that may have started off as a phenolic, but um, have been turned into something else, okay? And so the classification of this was based primarily on the fact that it contains a phenolic structure. Now, a lot of these phenolic compounds um, are made by a similar pathway. Now, the terpenoids that we discussed um, can also contain phenolic groups. But for the most part, most of the guys that we're going to be talking about now are derived from the amino acids, uh, tyrosine, phenylalanine. And when you have a phenolic compound made through the terpenoid pathways, they're made through ice, using isoprenians. Okay, so there is a slight difference, even though there's overlap here. So this slide may not be that visible in yours, but um, the idea is that these phenolic compounds, compounds can be simple ones, you can make what are called phenolic acids, or phenylpropanoids can be used to make things like essential oils, but they can also be used to make uh, bioflavonoids, like the yellow and blue compounds you find in fruits and vegetables. Some of them are the phytoestrogens that we talked about in soy. Other ones make uh, other phytoestrogens uh, called lignans that you find in flax. So there's a huge group of these guys. And then this doesn't even include this slide, the compounds that you'll find in uh, that are related to the phenolics, like anthraquinone glycosides that are laxatives or naphthoquinones that are um, uh, used as antimicrobials, okay? So to start off with, a phenolic or a phenol group is basically a benzene ring, ring with an OH group attached to it. Now the significance of this is when you look at that six-membered ring at the top there, those double bonds are conjugated. And what happens in real life is they're not static. They don't just sit there like that. They actually form a halo around this. And that OH group is also involved with disseminating or moving the electrons around this ring structure. And so why this is significant is that this OH group can accept and donate electrons relatively easily. It's a fairly... Uh, good accept, uh, electron acceptor, and it can go back and forth. And so the significance of this is they can be used to sequester free radicals and then hand them off to other compounds. And those other compounds could be, for example, carotenoids or uh, some kind of enzyme system in the body um, to neutralize these free radicals. So that's one important, I guess, uh, action that all these phenol compounds have is they can act as antioxidants, okay? Now, another important thing that these, that these uh, phenol groups can have is because a lot of these can interact with certain um, enzyme systems like cyclooxygenase in the body, they can act as anti-inflammatories. And so um, that's another important thing. Now, often when you have an anti-inflammatory effect, Inflammation seems to be a really, a really bad, but it is necessary process in the body. So you need inflammation for, um, for repair mechanisms in the body and several other things. Um, so when you twist your ankle, yeah, you need, you need a little bit of inflammation to uh, stimulate the body to go and repair the damaged muscles or tendons or whatever it may be. But too much inflammation will also cause damage to the tissues. And then that's one of the reasons why you might apply ice to, to your ankle to prevent the swelling from getting out of hand. So too much inflammation is bad. Uh, and if you didn't have any inflammation, that could be bad as well. However, as we age, we tend to become more inflamed. And as a result, that inflammatory process uh, is involved with a lot of degenerative diseases. I would say that inflammation in general is 
in my opinion, it's kind of uh, associated with um, with the aging process. And the more inflammation you have, systemic inflammation, the more it increases your mortality, your risk of mortality, your risk of dying. Okay. So people with autoimmune diseases where there's lots of inflammation in the body are more likely to die from heart disease because inflammation in one part of the body can end up affecting inflammation in other parts of the body. Okay. And when you have inflammation, inflammation tends to trigger certain cells in the body. So it could lead to things like osteoporosis because inflammation can stimulate osteoclasts and break down bone. It can also stimulate cancer cells because inflammation is involved with uh, various cytokines that can uh, promote the growth of certain things in the body, including cancer cells. In addition to uh, inflammation targeting cancer and stimulating the growth, indirectly, phenol compounds through other mechanisms outside of the inflammatory process can stimulate things like apoptosis by interacting with various receptors on cells uh, and altering the expression of certain genes. And so um, phenolic compounds are important in that regard. And then finally, one of the good things about phenolic compounds is they can scavenge free radicals. One of the bad things about phenolic compounds is they can generate free radicals. And in some cases, generating free radicals can uh, be bad because it creates basically a toxic environment. But in some cases, that can be used to your advantage to kill off bacteria. And so most phenolic compounds that you find in your diet related to uh, flavonoids, anthocyanins, like those purple and red and blue colors you find in fruits and vegetables, or the yellow colors in turmeric, in general, eating a diet that has uh, these compounds in it is health promoting. Taking a single antioxidant phenolic compound or even a carotenoid that we talked about in high amounts could potentially cause harm by instead of sequestering free radicals by generating or releasing free radicals. Okay, so appreciate when you hear something's a good antioxidant, an oversimplified way of looking at it is to say that these are good for you and they protect you from all sorts of things and they scavenge free radicals. But supplementation of uh, high amounts of single antioxidants, whether it's a carotenoid or a phenolic compound, has the potential to be harmful, and certainly research supports that. And so I think one of the benefits of eating a diet rich in these things is that you're getting uh, a whole rainbow or a whole team of antioxidants that are working together in the way that sort of Mother Nature designed us, or rather we evolved being uh, around these things. So there's a, there's a health promoting aspect. And then taking supplements uh, like in pure form could be dangerous. It could be beneficial, it could be dangerous. And it's sort of, that's where the science needs to come in. Because uh, in my opinion, if we've been eating uh, blueberries for you know, a million years, you don't, I doubt it's going to be unhealthy. And I'm pretty confident that antioxidant in that form is going to be healthy for you. And I think the research does support that. But if you were to take a single compound out of blueberries and take it a hundred times the dose that you'd find in the fruit, then that becomes more like a drug than, uh, than a, a nutrient. And you would want to do the proper research, in my opinion, to ensure that that would be safe. You know? um, and that's just my opinion, because it may not be. Okay, So whole herbs, whole fruits, I would say that uh, more likely to be safe than something that's isolated, you know, one compound's isolated and, high, and given you high amounts. So phenolic compounds, a lot of the benefits of a whole foods plant-based diet uh, is related to phenolic compounds, because you get a lot of phenolic compounds when you're eating lots of fruits and vegetables. Uh, when you're eating a diet in India, for example, which uh, is loaded with spices, spices are rich in phenolic compounds. So some of the benefits the low or the low rates of cancer in India are associated with um, the spices in their diet. 
Um, now they have diabetes because they eat too much sugar and they're starting to eat more meat. So that's sort of offsetting some of the benefits of these phenolics. But, um, you know, there's phenolic compounds are one of many important parts of a healthy diet. So diseases, eating a diet rich in phenolic compounds is going to help prevent degenerative diseases. So uh, I would imagine that even arthritis will be lower. Osteoporosis, um, certain types of dementia, Alzheimer's, heart disease. Uh, can protect against a number of different types of cancers. So you got to eat these things in your diet, okay? Um, also, some specific ones have benefits against certain types of infections, okay? And anything that's good against infections may or may not be good to eat in high amounts on a daily basis, okay? So polyphenols are ubiquitous, or phenol compounds are ubiquitous in nature. So polyphenols, just because I keep saying that accidentally, a polyphenol is basically a compound that has more than one phenol group on it, okay? Um, and so the flavonoids, uh, like quercetin that we talked about earlier, or the blue colors, those anthocyanidins in, in blueberries, those have more than one uh, phenol group, and that's why they're called polyphenols. But there's lots of healthy, uh, like gingerol, which is a phenolic compound in, in ginger, uh, only has one phenolic group, group in it, while curcumin and turmeric has two. Okay, so it would be one would be a polyphenol, the other one is. So these phenolic compounds are ubiquitous in nature and they're going to be high in the diet with rich in fruits and vegetables. Um, even protein contains phenolic compounds. So um, Phenyl, uh, tyrosine, for example, uh, has that. And when you look at the structures on the left, the top one is phenol. The compound before that is catechol. Catechol gets its name because it's two OH groups side by side. Catechol is an important compound because a lot of the various flavonoids that we'll talk about have a catechol like structure. And appreciate if you know, if you remember anything from um, neurology, um, catechol amines are neurotransmitters that have a catechol group, and that includes dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine. And so, no surprise if a phytochemical has a catechol group, it could have the potential for interacting with epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And the effects of that could be is that they could possibly slow down the heart rate or have a beneficial effect on blood sugar or they may have um, stimulating effects or they may inhibit the breakdown of these neurotransmitters or they may modulate these the trans uh, the, the receptors of these uh, neurotransmitters and a lot of fruits and vegetables that contain these polyphenols often will lower blood pressure they have positive effects on um on uh, some of them will have an effect on dopamine levels potentially, okay? So that's just one thing to think about in the back of your mind. Now, another compound called hydroquinone, this is more reactive than uh, the other two, and this one seems to be able to readily accept and donate electrons. Uh, I got a 647, I don't know if this is someone in the class trying to set something up or what's going on, but I'm gonna turn that off, so. Uh, I don't know who that is. I don't know why they would be calling me. Um, I'm just kind of worried that that could be somebody who's. Yeah, one second. Hello, Max speaking. No idea who that is. What's going on? So. Um, so there you go. So hydroquinone, one thing about that is it alone is a very reactive uh, compound that can actually cause, have a bleaching-like effect. So that would be a kind of a dangerous thing to be consuming a lot of, okay? So here are the simplest phenols. So you got phenol, which really doesn't exist for very long uh, in this free form in plants because um, it's going to be very, very volatile and it's going to just probably disappear pretty quickly. But it usually is a heavier molecule and it exists as a glycoside in some form. We'll talk about those. Hydroquinone can readily exchange electrons to go from hydroquinone to benzoquinone. So uh, as it becomes more oxidized, uh, sorry, reduced, it will accept electrons and then uh, become more uh, 
uh, reduced to form the benzoyl okay? Now a herb that you may have heard of is bearberry. This is not the same as barberry. Bearberry is a cousin of cranberries and blueberries. Um, you don't really eat the fruit of this guy, uh, but the leaves and the whole plant can be used for treating various infections of the urinary tract. And it's considered to be a urinary uh, antiseptic. It also has some astringent properties with it as well, so it's a urinary astringent. And it's mainly used to treat urinary tract infections. It has a very specific mechanism that works. Now, there could be other things going on. There will be some tannins in there that we'll talk about later on that exert an effect. Um, but the way that this herb works is arbutin is a glycoside. So here's a sugar molecule of hydroquinone. And what happens is, like other glycosides, in the presence of acid or in the presence of certain enzymes, this sugar molecule can be removed and then liberates the hydroquinone or a glucose molecule. So certain E. coli bacteria, or certain bacteria including E. coli, which commonly cause urinary tract infections, they have an enzyme called beta-glucoxidase. And so when you consume arbutin, eventually some of it will dissociate in your stomach because of the stomach acid there, which may not be a good thing. I would imagine if you're eating arbutin on a daily basis uh, in high amounts, you could potentially uh, cause a lot of free radical damage in the stomach that might end up increasing the risk of stomach cancer. Certainly, there's been suggestions from animal studies with that. Nothing in humans. Um, but eventually, this arbutin molecule, I think what can also happen is some of it gets absorbed uh, as hydroquinone and then get the liver will probably conjugate it back and they form another glycoside. Other forms, it maybe gets absorbed intact, but it makes its way into the urinary tract. And in the urinary tract, when the bacteria come in contact with it, that possesses beta-glucoxidase enzyme, it will hydrolyze it because they want the glucose as a sugar, as a fuel source, but this hydroquinone molecule is now released and can now disrupt the cell membrane of the, uh, of the bacteria and potentially can release free radicals and, or uh, accept and release free radicals to cause sort of oxidative stress. So it'll disrupt the cell membrane integrity as well as potentially increasing free radicals and having like a bleaching like effect. So the idea with arbutin, arbutin is kind of like a mousetrap where it's baited with uh, sugar instead of cheese and the hydroquinone gets released once the glucose is removed, okay? So that's an example of, uh, of a hydroquinone glycoside which is a type of phenolic compound, okay? So that's the simplest form that I can think of that exists in plants uh, in a stable form. Now, phenolic acids are another group of compounds uh, that are important in the phenolic group. And phenolic acids, what that means is you have a carboxylic acid group attached to the phenolic ring. And one compound we've already talked about is nature's aspirin, salicylic acid, which um, doesn't have the acetyl group on it. So salicylic acid has is probably the, uh, the simplest phenolic acid. So you have that carboxylic acid group attached to a phenolic ring. And so salicylic acid is an anti-inflammatory. And it often exists as a, a glycoside in the plant. Uh, another example would be gallic acid. And gallic acid is a really important compound associated with uh, astringent compounds called tannins, okay? And so hydrolyzable tannins like those found in tea will have a gallic acid molecule with uh, sugar molecules attached. So tannic acid, for example, is basically a glycoside of gallic acid. So those would be two common and simple versions of phenolic acids. These exist in lots of fruits and vegetables in some form, okay? So um, they're found in high amounts in certain plants, like willow bark has a lot of salicylic acid in it. And I'm very confident, even though I haven't looked it up, that it'll also contain gallic acid as well, because lots of trees in the bark 
uh, will have that. Benzoic acid is not a true phenol uh, phenolic acid because it doesn't actually have that OH group. Uh, but benzoic acid, the reason why I'm mentioning that, is that it is found in fruits and vegetables. I remember as a kid, we used to get these orange juice in plastic uh, cups and had a, a foil lid to it. And they always had this weird metallic sort of taste to it. And benzoic acid gives it that sort of weird taste. And it's added as a preservative um, to various foods. So, yes, it's a natural preservative, but it's probably not that good for you, okay? Down the high amounts of it, okay? Um, so, those are common uh, phenolic acids. Gallic acids are astringents. They do have anti-inflammatory. Too much of this can be toxic for people, though. Salicylic acid, uh, anti-inflammatory, uh, that's one of the big things. It also has, can potentially cause ulcers and has some damaging effects. So these are good, but bad as well. You know, high amounts of these uh, can get you into trouble. Um, now, elagic acid is a compound that's common in fruits and vegetables, especially uh Raspberries will have high amounts, and pomegranates have numerous phytochemicals, but one of the things that pomegranates have is elagic acid, and it usually exists as a glycoside, and part of the astringent properties associated with pomegranates is associated with glycosides of elagic acid, and it also may have some blood pressure lowering effect. It may have um, uh, positive effects as an antioxidant, it may help with prostate cancer. Uh, so lots of health benefits as well. And when you think about it, um, again, pomegranates, they're really good for you because in addition to the elagic acids, they also have anthocyanidins, which are the red compounds in fruits and vegetables, or, or one class of red compounds. Um, and there's certainly some research showing benefits of, the, of pomegranates for blood pressure as well, for prostate cancer, for low libido, potentially, they'll thus not 95% st statistical significance, but um, but the problem with pomegranate juice is it's loaded with sugar. So I used to drink a lot of it, but now I'm starting to think that there's just too much sugar in it to make it healthy. So maybe a little splash might be good, but um, you know, too much could just result in diabetes. So appreciate just because it contains several phytochemicals that have health benefits doesn't mean that eating a lot of it's going to be good for you because um, because there could be other bad things in it, right? So, uh, so there's the elagic acid. So, uh, one thing you can remember about that is it's a dimer of gallic acid. I could ask it on the exam. On the exam. I might mention that it's a hydrolyzable tan and it will turn up later on. So, those are two two things that I might ask about it. And the fact that it's a phenolic acid, that's another thing you should know. So, phenylpropanoids get their name from the fact that they're derived from phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is an amino acid. And so what makes an amino acid different than everything else we're talking about? Uh, uh, sorry, someone asked me what a dimer was. A dimer uh, is basically when you have di meaning two versions of this two of these identical compounds stuck together gives you a dimer so elagic acid if you look at this i've highlighted gallic acid on one side so it's basically two gallic acid molecules stuck together and so if you break it down you can see it looks like a complex molecule but it's pretty simple you make two of these guys pop them together it's an easy uh it's easy chemically to stick these guys together because in general oh groups love interacting with carboxylic acid groups okay so, going back to the phenylpropanoids. Phenylpropanoids are derived from amino acids that are either phenylalanine or tyrosine. Phenylalanine um, gets its name because phenyl, this little phenyl is the aromatic ring. Phenol is when there's an OH group attached to it. And then uh, propanoids refers to the fact that there's three carbons. So propane gas is made of three carbons. So phenylpropanoid means you've got a phenyl ring and then you've got uh, three carbon side chain to it. 
And if it's an acid, then there's going to be an OH group onto it. Now, in the case in the case of an amino acid, you've got the carboxylic acid, which is the acid component, and then you've got the amine, the nitrogen group, um, that is the amino acid name. Okay, so this is an amino acid. You've got the nitrogen, you've got the carboxylic acid group. So this is something that's important in in proteins. Plants will make this and they can use this to make other compounds from it. So the first step is removing the nitrogen group, and then you have a building block for making all sorts of other compounds, okay? So phenylalanine can be used to make flavonoids, it can be used to make anthocyanins, it can be used to make a whole bunch of things we'll talk about, okay? So the difference between tyrosine and phenyl phenylalanine is the addition of one OH group. So you can make, tyrosine from phenylalanine. So phenylalanine is an essential amino acid. Tyrosine is it's not considered essential because you can peel it from the phenylalanine. Or at least I think so. I have to double check that's been a while since I looked at that. Plants at least can do that. So it's used to make phenylpropanoids that are used to make all these other compounds. Okay. So there's a group of compounds called phenylpropenes. And these are probably Easiest to look at these is these are the first kind of group of compounds you can make from phenylpropanoids, okay? So what a phenylpropene is, in chemistry, when you see E-N-E, -E, ene, that refers to a double bond, okay? And so in this case, phenylpropenes um, are an important group of compounds found in essential oils. So essential oils are primarily made of the monoterpenes and the sesquiterpenes, as well as uh, the phenylpropenes, okay? So phenylpropenes, you start off with basically uh, with uh, phenylalanine or, or tyrosine, you cleave off the amino group, and then you, in this case, you remove the carboxylic acid group at the end, and then you get this double bond on the, uh, on the three carbon ring, uh, three carbon uh, side chain, okay? So, phenyl refers to the aromatic ring, propene refers to three carbon side chain. And if you remember, the monoterpenes and the phenylpropenes, they look very similar. The main difference is monoterpenes start off with 10 carbons and the phenylpropenes start off with nine carbons when they're done. Now, if you look at the anethol at the bottom, and this gives uh, anise and phenyl its uh, black licorice taste to it. If you add up the carbons, there's actually 10 carbons there, but this little methyl group was added to the, to the phenolic ring at the end there. So it's not really part of the initial construction. It's kind of like an add-on later on. So this has three carbons on the side chain, six on the ring, you got nine carbons here, and then they've added an extra one later on. It's easy to add methyl groups to, to OH groups uh, on these phenolic rings later on, okay? So the fact that it lacks the carboxylic acid group means that it's not going to be as water soluble because that carboxylic acid group has two oxygens, and anything that has a lot of oxygens is, uh, the more oxygens, oxygens you add, the more water soluble it begins, okay? So in this case, it's not that water soluble. It's a little lighter because you've knocked off uh, uh, this clunkier uh, carboxylic acid group. Uh, and it's not going to have the hydrogen bond that it would with the water. So it's going to be able to evaporate more readily. And this is probably ballpark has uh, uh, boiling points of around 300 degrees Celsius. That's typically what these guys are at. Maybe a little lower, a little higher, depending on um, the structure. So like the essential oils that we talked about, the monoterpenes, so these are basically, in my mind, functionally almost identical to monoterpenes, okay? But phenylpropenes and monoterpenes, they're both considered essential oils, aromatic oils, volatile oils, whatever term you want to use. So what that means is they all, from a herbal standpoint, act as carminatives. They help promote digestion. And so if you go to an Indian restaurant, when you leave, there's always a little bowl of seeds there. And that's usually anise, fennel, 
You could have cumin or caraway as well in there. Those types of seeds, dill even, all those seeds that you find in your in your culinary, in your uh, spice drawer at home, all are rich in these phenylpropene compounds. And these compounds uh, improve digestion by they relax capillaries to allow uh, blood flow to go to the intestinal organs. They tend to relax sphincters and smooth muscles, which can help you pass gas and also relieve cramping in, in the uh, uh, gastrointestinal tract. So internally, it can be used for that purpose. Essential oils in general um, also can have some antimicrobial effects. These essential oils are not unlike turpentine, um, like that you find with the mono, uh, with the monoterpene. So uh, turpentine is made exclusively from pinene. Uh, anethol comes from plants. They're very fat soluble. They tend to disrupt cell membranes and have an irritating effect there. So, as we mentioned before, with the essential oils, um, there are safety concerns with taking high amounts. That applies with consuming essential oils. If you're going to have, uh, let's say, clove, if you have five grams of clove, it probably won't make you feel too good. If you have like the whole herb and you made a tea out of it, it would be very strong and and uh, just wouldn't taste great. You probably wouldn't die from it though. But if you took five grams of the essential oil from clove, it would likely kill you or potentially kill you. It's it's quite toxic, it can damage the liver and kidneys. And so high amounts of a certain uh, of certain essential oils can cause death. And that implies most of these are pretty toxic. Okay. Now, so the benefits is permanent today to microbial. The issues with it is they can be toxic. Um, just appreciate that. If you're drinking any kind of essential, it's going to be toxic. But some of them, based on where this double bond is, can make them even more toxic, okay? Now, here's a bunch of uh, phenylpropene. Cinnamon, aldehyde is found in cinnamon. Anise contains anethol. It's also found in uh, fennel to some degree. Estragol is found in basil and also holy basil. Myristicin is found in nutmeg, okay? Um, there's... Some people, some nutmeg, if you were to snort it or take it in high amounts, can have a slight hallucinogenic effect. Uh, I didn't, I've never done that. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and that's related to this myristicin compound that seems to modulate some dopamine receptors in the body. Saffron, which is found in sassafras, uh, this was a component in the original root beers uh, until they found it started causing cancer. Okay. Um, Ujinol, which is in clove, um, it's used or used to be used by the dental industry, applied to the gum to have a numbing effect. And it has uh, that property where it can actually act as an analgesic or an anesthetic, like it can de decrease pain. Uh, so all these have a lot of smells, uh, aromas associated with them. So a lot of uh, the aromatic properties of spices is associated with these types of compounds. They all have fermented effects. When you look at Ujinol, Saffron, Myristicin, and even Estragol, they all have a terminal uh, double bond. And what I've observed is that compounds that have this terminal double bond appear to have uh, an association with liver cancer. Saffron is probably one of the most well-known uh, compounds to cause liver uh, uh, cancer, and one of because of that, the FDA has removed it as a food additive. You're not allowed to use sass saffron or sassafras um, uh, in high amounts uh, as an additive food because it caused liver cancer. So root beer that you drink now would have been different than root beer from 100 years ago. Um, saffron has been moved, removed because of that. You know, if you're having a liter of that a day, you're going to develop liver cancer. Okay. Now, what's less well known is the damage or how toxic eugenol is, myristicin and, and estragol are in humans. When you're eating basil, basil not only does it have like basil, the whole spice when you're adding it to a salad, you will get some small amounts of estragol. That gives it that beautiful basil-like smell. But there are so many other compounds in the plant 
that have anti-cancer effects and they can protect the liver and do other things, that eating basil is good for you. But I would think that consuming the essential oil of basil in high amounts on a daily basis probably would lead to liver cancer. I would bet my money on that. I really would. So I could be wrong, but I know that ugenol is, is hepatotoxic and has to be used with care. And just looking at the structures, this is just me deducing it based on my knowledge of chemistry that these guys would be concerned. And it all seems to be less of an issue. And again, it doesn't have that terminal double bond. You don't really need to know any of this as I'm talking about it, you know, for the exam. Um, but I do want you to know that there's something else that'll come up later on. Um, for the exam purposes, I think what you need to take on from the phenylpropenes is that six carbon ring structure, three carbon side chain. I could ask you that. Beyond that, I'm not going to go into the details like anethol has a terminal double bond. I wouldn't ask you that. Later on, uh, we might talk in more detail about ugenol when we talk about safety. Uh, it'll come up again, but uh, knowing being able to tell the difference from their structure with all these is, is would just be a mean thing to ask. Okay. So phenylpropenes, like monoterpenes, essential oils. That's the take home from that. Some of them are hepatic toxic, hard on the liver. That's important as well. Okay. Now there's another group of compounds that are called hydroxycinamic acids. These compounds uh, are not as glamorous as some of the other phenolic compounds that we'll talk about, like curcumin and, and the anthocyanidins. But these phenylpropanoids uh, derivatives make up the bulk of, like a large percentage of phenolic compounds that exist in nature uh, are these guys. So these guys don't get enough credit because they're not as, exciting or as interesting as uh, something like curcumin is, but they are important. Like any auxin, they're going to have, or like any phenolic compound, they're going to have antioxidant properties, anti-cancer properties. Uh, they also have anti-diabetic properties, and this goes with a lot of the uh, phenolic compounds. And caffeic acid, which is shown at the bottom there, as well as ferulic acid and cumeric acids, are all um, uh, are found in lots of fruits and vegetables, okay? Uh, now, caffeic acid's found in coffee, but it's also found in tons of other fruits and vegetables. And there's other important compounds in coffee that we'll talk about in a second as well. So, these are water-soluble to some degree because of the presence of the OH group and the carboxylic acid group, okay? Um, Caffeic acid would be more water soluble than the hydroxycinamic acid, which I've talked. Now, these are also important building blocks for other compounds we're going to talk about later on as well. So they will come back, you know, at the end of the lecture. Okay. So just be aware of hydroxycin. I think the take home here is hydroxycinamic acids are phenolic compounds, and like a lot of phenolic compounds, they have the antioxidant, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory. Like I'm not going to. Trying to make it too difficult, but I do want to want you to remember these are uh, important phenolic compounds. Okay. So phenylalanine, amino acid, tyrosine, amino acid. You knock off the amino group here. You go and you get cyanamic acid. So you can go and make cyanamic acid directly from phenylalanine, and then make cumeric acid, or you can make tyrosine first. You can go either way. And then these are the our uh, hydroxycinamic acid and these end up becoming the building blocks for other more sophisticated uh, phenolics and polyphenols okay and then cinnam cinnam cinnamaldehyde is the uh, cinnamon smell that you get in cinnamon okay but that's not that hydro it's not hydroxycinamic acid it's a phenylpropene so just a little side note chlorogenic acid Chlorogenic acid is an interesting compound that's found in coffee. Um, and there are several different forms that it can exist depending on uh, the placement of the quinic acid and the caffeic acid and how they're related. So quinic acid is shown here. It's not a phenol compound. It looks to me like it was once derived from um, almost like gallic acid and you've lost the aromatic ring structure to it. This compound here, 
is an important compound in coffee and maybe one of the reasons why coffee has a lot of health benefits to it. Um, we know that coffee has a positive effect on blood sugar, so it lowers the risk for diabetes. We know that people who drink coffee um, are less likely to get heart disease, uh, blood clots, and stroke. It Coffee, for whatever the compounds in it, it may not just be the chlorogenic acid, it could be the caffeine, and there are other phenol compounds in there as well. But it can help lower the risk of gout. We know that coffee protects the liver and can help prevent liver cancer, fatty liver, cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, has protective effects against Alzheimer's. I'm assuming it's both the phenolic compounds and the caffeine and some other things. And coffee, even though it's been classified as a, as a carcinogen, and because the roasting process does produce some carcinogenic compounds, uh, ironically, it actually has anti-cancer properties in that it may protect against a whole bunch of different types of cancers, including uh, ones of the digestive tract, like gastric esophageal, some of the reproductive tract, uh, prostate, uh, endometrial, uh, but also skin cancer. So I don't even know how it gets to the skin, but somehow some of these compounds go to the skin and have exert some kind of effect either directly or indirectly there. So coffee is really good for you. Now, if you don't like coffee, you don't have to drink it. There's, you can drink tea and get lots of health benefits from that. Um, but there are a lot of health benefits. Now, the only thing is, remember when we were talking about, um, diterpenoids? There is a specific diterpenoid called cafestrol in coffee, which appears to elevate cholesterol. And it may be that things like espresso or uh, the little uh, coffee pods that a lot of people are using now, that when you have coffee that does not use a paper filter, so French press, espresso, those coffee pods, um, you could be getting a lot of the health benefits of coffee, but with the presence of this diterpenoid called cafestrol, it can elevate cholesterol, and it could be doing other things that we don't know about. So I'm curious. I've been trying to figure out whether or not it's healthier to consume paper filter coffee over the espressos and stuff. I love them both, and I drink a lot, a lot of them, but it may be that the cafestrol may also have some effects on blood sugar in a negative way, I'm wondering, because I was reading a study. So coffee's good. Lots of coffee's good. It decreases all-cause mortality. Caffeine can leave you feeling a little strung out, so you got to watch out for that. You still get a lot of benefits from decaf versus caffeinated. I think caffeine also has health benefits as well, but you got to be careful. The benefits of coffee is different than the benefits of tea, so you could drink both and get... Now, other benefits. Oh, another thing I was going to say is that uh, gallstones, coffee seems to have a protective effect against gallstones as well. A lot of the patients I have, or the majority of the patients who come in complaining of gallstones have, um, are not coffee drinkers, is what I've observed, okay? Uh, so there you go. Uh, ben, I'll answer your question over here. And asking if you should answer uh, or if we should add the carcinogenic carcinogenic action to estragol. Yeah, you can, for sure. I mean, that's my opinion. Uh, I'm sure I've been looking around. I'll find a study to support that. So what chlorogenic acid is, is the take home for that is it contains a quinic acid molecule, which is derived from, it's not a phenol compound, but it is presumably derived from a phenol compound with caffeic acid attached. And an exam question I might say is, uh, some of the health benefits of coffee is associated with A, chlorogenic acid, B, anthocyanidin, C, fiber, or D, you know, that might be a question I could ask. Um, or I might say chlorogenic acid has been shown to uh, A, lower the risk of diabetes, heart disease, gout, liver cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and prevent cancer, or B, increase the risk of cancer, C, have a phytoestrogen effect. Those would be kind of questions I might ask. Uh, question, do you know if coffee has antifungal properties? I've been told that coffee being contaminated with, with mold, so I have not been drinking it. Um, 
I probably, I don't think, it ha I don't have a clue if it has antifungal properties. I don't, I don't think it does. I think a lot of, a lot of things that are grown in warm, moist environments, including coffee, including peanuts, including lots of nuts, including certain grains, uh, even ginger, um, tend to be contaminated with fungal products and mold. I would, I would say, if not stored properly. And so that's something that's a concern, but um, I don't know how you even control that. So yeah, that, that could be an issue, but how much gets in there, how, I, I don't know. Uh, and some of those molds can be toxic because they produce aflatoxin, so we'll talk about it later on. So we talked about some simple phenolic compounds that are found in uh, essential oils. We've talked about uh, the uh, uh, phenolic acids. Uh, and now we're going to move on to some polyphenols that are important. So there is a group of polyphenols called curcuminoids. Now these are I would say curcumin is probably one of the most well-researched polyphenols. And it's found in turmeric, which is curcuma longa. There are other species of curcuma uh, that are likely to have uh, these curcuminoids in it. But turmeric is the most popular one. And turmeric is that beautiful yellow spice you find in a lot of Indian cooking. And so... Because curcumin is a, uh, a phenolic compound, no surprise, it's going to have antioxidant properties. It's well known to have anti-inflammatory, has anti-cancer properties, uh, has positive effects on the liver, protects it from damage from our various things. Uh, it appears to increase the production of bile or release of bile, um, presumably through that compound. So. And some other polyphenols will do that uh, last two indications as well. So almost all polyphenols have this antioxidant, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory effects. Um, it's just some of them are stronger. Now, when you look at the structure of tumor or of uh, curcumin, it's basically you take what looks like to be a caffeic, caffeic acid and a ferulic acid molecule, those cumeric acids, and two of them are stuck together, okay? And so, yeah, ferulic acid and caffeic acid alone have antioxidant effects and some other properties, but the curcumin just seems to be a stronger acting. It's more potent and it has other properties. And so uh, I would say curcumin supplements are probably one of the most popular supplements on the market right now, especially for as anti-inflammatories. And they don't, cause uh, stomach ulcers like um, traditional anti-inflammatory drugs, and they have a lot of side benefits. In addition to uh, helping to reduce uh, uh, heart disease, cancer, um, they're great for your liver, uh, they may prevent Alzheimer's disease, like turmeric is one of those spices that I, I try to get it, uh, maybe not daily, but if I can, I try to get a little bit of a daily into me. I might throw a quarter teaspoon in my shake in the morning. And when I add a quarter teaspoon to my shake, um, that's probably a very safe amount and it's gonna have some health benefits uh, as just health promotion and health prevention. I don't have any active, uh, I don't have any known active diseases going on right now. So, I, and I like to keep it that way. So adding a little bit of turmeric to my diet is probably having a quarter teaspoon would be comparable to if I was eating curry daily. Um, and people in India eat turmeric probably every single day, or most people do. And so having it as a dietary amount, having a quarter teaspoon, I can't see any way that that could cause any harm to me, uh, except for maybe a little reflux if you took a whole bunch before you went to bed, and that would be one side effect. Um, but if you were to take high amounts of curcumin long term, it could be very safe and effective for a bunch of things. For health promotion, I wouldn't want to do that, curcumin in isolation, just because 
I would be concerned that it could cause harm that I that hasn't been explored yet. So it's probably safe. Uh, but you know, no one's been taking 99% pure curcumin one gram a day for 40 years at this point as far as I know, and it certainly hasn't been researched, you know, because it hasn't been around in that pure form for a while. And when you consume turmeric, turmeric, um, the health benefits of it is associated with curcumin, but appreciate when you have a curcumin supplement, it's different than eating the whole food, okay? And in some ways it could be better because you're getting a more concentrated form. And there are some products on the market where they've attached certain things or form my cells to increase the absorption so you have better uh, anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory effects and that might be good but the whole herb has other compounds in it so turmeric is just one compound there are other curcuminoids in addition to curcumin that could have slightly different benefits or maybe there's a synergistic effect of having them all together or maybe not I don't I don't know Curcumin is one, but there are other slightly different versions where, depending on where those methyl groups, if there's an extra methyl group added on, you know, one of the other OH groups or um, or ones removed or whatever will alter the function slightly. Um, so different curcuminoids. Also, turmeric contains carbohydrates that have been shown to have anti-inflammatory effects as well. And so there was one study where they removed the curcuminoids from turmeric and they tested the remaining stuff, which is primarily the carbohydrates, to see if it had any anti-inflammatory effects and they found that it did. So likely those carbohydrates will exert an anti-inflammatory effect through a different mechanism than turmeric does. So Supplement companies would say, yes, you know, curcumin is not well absorbed and our product is going to increase the absorption, but it could be the carbohydrates along with the curcumin that makes the whole herb work just as good or even better than the isolates. Or maybe it doesn't, I don't know. No one's really doing like, you know, if you take no name brand turmeric and take a quarter teaspoon a day, how does that compare between taking the, you know, $60 a bottle supplement two capsules a day? Like, no one's done that comparison uh, to see what the outcomes are. Um, the other thing is that it may not be just, there's also essential oils in curcumin that exert some positive effects, like some of the carminative properties of turmeric would be associated with essential oils in there. And furthermore, one of the things that we don't look at is when you look at the effects of curcumin, we're assuming that curcumin is the only uh, structure in the in the in the uh, uh, polyphenols found in turmeric that exerted an effect, but it might be that curcumin is broken down by your gut bacteria or in your liver, releasing other compounds into circulation that can also exert an anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer effect. So you know it's rare that curcumin alone is going to last for very long in that form, and that the breakdown products of curcumin likely exert some positive effects and some of those might be better absorbed and some of them might exert effects right in the gastrointestinal tract that could modulate your gut bugs or modulate your immune system there to exert effects in this and uh, systemically and so i haven't done a thorough re you know systematic review of all the research on it but i caution uh, you to get your education exclusively from supplement companies, even though I think they, they have good intentions. I'm not saying they're evil or anything, but I think actually supplement companies are trying to make good products to help people, uh, but their agenda is to make a business, to run a business. And it's easy to ignore non-profitable research if it exists, okay? Uh, got a few questions here. What would be a good therapeutic dose of curcumin for inflammation and for joints? Um, if you're looking at curcumin, the supplement, I don't have an answer for that because there are so many different supplements, versions of curcumin on the market. Some of them contain black pepper, uh, a compound called piperine that increases the absorption potentially. Uh, originally, the studies were done in rats and they showed a huge increase. And then some studies showed that black pepper doesn't help with the absorption of 
curcumin in humans, and then some trials showed that it did. And so I used to recommend black pepper with turmeric, and then I stopped recommending it because the research showed it didn't work. And then I looked at the research again, and maybe it does work. So I don't know what research is so conflicting with stuff. Uh, if you want to add some black pepper, it maybe it does, maybe it does. It's hard to it's hard to know. And if the research comes out showing it does benefit, then great. Um, I, I get kind of confused with this, and I'm sure you do as well. Uh, so like I said, I found at least one study showing black pepper doesn't work that way, and other studies that show it does, so I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an expert on it right now. Um, so turmeric, I think there are benefits. If you have anyone who's got cancer, I'm pretty much guaranteeing I'm going to give them tumor because it's going to have induced apoptosis and decreased inflammation of lots of other things. <clears throat> Some of these things will be preventative well, as well. Um, certainly tumor uh, can help prevent atherosclerosis uh, just by the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. And I would say that you guys were all 20. Do you need to take a tumor supplement? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, unless you have something actively going on, you want to throw a little pinch in here and there i don't think it's going to hurt you i think the real benefits you get it the older you are the more necessary it is to take these things because as you get older you tend to get more inflammation and your risk for heart disease and cancer and diabetes and everything goes up uh even if you're eating a healthy diet uh mediterranean based diet you know people eating the mediterranean diet still get cancer um and still get heart disease so the older you get, probably the greater benefit you would get from taking uh, something like turmeric. But young people with no health concerns, uh, likely you'll never know, know notice the benefit. But if you want to throw some in your shake and eat some curry, I think that's a good thing. Okay, but I wouldn't take a handful of you know curcumin supplement, uh, high dose, long term, uh, because you're not treating anything, and for health promotion. You know, who knows if that's a bad thing to do long term. Another compound, uh, another herb that I really like that I take daily is rosemary. Now, rosemary has a whole bunch of interesting compounds in it. There are essential oils in rosemary. If you apply rosemary topically to your hair and your shampoo, it can help with hair growth, apparently. Uh, it would, I, I don't put it in my shampoo regularly, but I do like it in there for the smell of it whether it helps with hair loss or not. I would be a poor uh, case study for that, but um, it might slow down hair loss in men that have the genetic predisposition. Um, so there, the essential oils in rosemary have health benefits. There are flavonoids in uh, rosemary that have benefits. There are tannins in rosemary. Uh, there's also a couple interesting uh, diterpenoids in rosemary called carnosol rosmanol. And these compounds I find really interesting. So they're a diterpenoid, but they're actually, they have an OH group. So they'd be very fat soluble. So if you had infused olive oil with some rosemary in it, you'd be getting a lot of these compounds in it. And for some reason, my gut tells me rosemary is really, really good. Oh, there's triterpenoids in rosemary as well. That I think I mentioned last week, I have health benefits. So there's so many different compounds in it. And there's an area in Greece, or no, in Italy where, uh, they get a lot of centurions, so people live over a hundred there, and there's a whole bunch of factors. They good community. I think they like to have a lot of sex there as well when they're older. They eat, you know, good food. They eat some fish, and they eat a lot of rosemary in their diet. And so I actually, in my shakes, I always throw a little bit of rosemary in it. And in addition to all these other compounds, and I think it's misleading when I present stuff as like. Here's the one phytochemical, and here I'm going to talk about rosmarinic acid, which is a polyphenol that's kind of similar to, to curcumin in some ways. Like it's it's basically made from two cyanic acid groups stuck together. Um, it's found in rosemary, uh, hence the name rosmarinic acid. It's also found in lots of other spices. Some of these are in the mint family. Some of these are in other um, other plants. Uh, doing research on it, obviously antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer. Uh, I think rosemary acid is also responsible for some anti-allergic properties associated with rosemary. 
and some other herbs that have uh, that can be used for for allergies. At, uh, Aurelia is a herb from uh, in Asia that's used as a spice, but also used for allergies. Um, and so, rosemary acid will be more water soluble than the diterpenoids and the triterpenoids uh, in uh, rosemary. The thing on is that I think rosemary is a awesome spice and I take a few little of uh, those uh, leaves or needles or whatever you want to call it in my shake. I take a little small teaspoon or half a teaspoon throughout my shake because I've seen studies showing that the compounds, various compounds for whatever reason, induce apoptosis and help acid sclerosis. They do so many things and it increases circulation. I'm like, why not throw a little bit in my, in my diet? Because those Italians that are living a long time are eating it. Um, I can't say definitively that it'll live any longer if I eat it, but I think it's a great way to get some of these awesome antioxidants, okay? Uh, do you know why they say that rosemary essential oil is good for memory? Oh, I've heard that. Um, I know rosemary is a, in herbal medicine, it's believed to be a circul circulatory stimulant. Uh, Maybe the essential oils have a vasodilating effect and increase blood flow to the brain. Maybe if rosemary as a like the question is, is it just the essential oil that has that memory enhancing effect? Or is it the fact that when you eat rosemary, in addition to the essential oil, there's all these other phenolic compounds? And that I don't know. Okay. But I think a little bit of daily wouldn't be a bad thing to do. So we're getting close to a huge group of compounds. Uh, we're still we're still talking about polyphenols. Now we're going to talk about flavonoids and stilbenoids. Flavonoids and stilbenoids are basically uh, derived from hydroxysinanic acid, or it's also called cumeric acid, and then a bunch of acetyl groups are added onto this side chain to make it longer, and then it'll form a cyclonization reaction with that will either give you three rings or two rings, okay? So a three ring structure, polyphenol compound, uh, are the group of compounds that are called flavonoids, or, and that includes a whole bunch of groups of different ones that we'll talk about. And then you've got stilbenoids <coughs> that are found in a whole bunch of, a bunch of fruits anyways, and, and some other things. Uh, called stilbenoids. And so resveratrol is one of the compounds in red wine that has health benefits. So if you look at it, there are two phenolic rings on both of these compounds. Flavonoids have a three carbon bridge. This little OH group uh, is kind of an unusual little bridge structure you see in the flavonoids. Stilbenoids only have two carbon bridge separating the two phenolic ones. Okay. So the basic structure is C6, that's ring structure number one, C3, that's your little bridge connecting them, and then another C6, while the stilbenoids are C6, C2, and C6, okay? So stilbenoids is a polyphenol because there's two phenol groups. You got that two carbon side bridge. All these conjugated bonds here, um, I would say resveratrol has in addition to the usual antioxidant properties, a couple of interesting things that it does is it's believed to have anti-aging effects. And when it comes to longevity, one of the most important things that if you want to live a long time is to not overeat. Okay, so not overeating is one of the biggest things. Not eating a lot of that thiamine uh, may be one of the reasons why a caloric restricted diet is so good for you because methionine is amino acid high in animal protein, so that may be one of the tricks to longevity, is just not eating a lot of meat in general. But I think, you know, yogis and mentalists don't overeat, only eat the 70% of your stomach for years. And actually, caloric restriction, where you're getting all the necessary nutrients, but you're uh, almost starving yourself, seems to stimulate a whole bunch of different uh, um, expression of uh, various genes in your body that help to promote longevity. and may make animals live an extra, let's say, 20 or 30 percent. So if a normally if a rat dies in three years of natural causes, it might make it to four years of natural causes. Eventually you die of something, but um, 
you might be able to push the upper limit, okay? And that's when you look at areas like the blue zones where they live over 100, there are certain behaviors and, and habits that they all sort of seem to have. One of them, they don't eat a lot of meat. Uh, they don't tend to overeat. Uh, they got good communities and all that. Um, and those are some of the, the, the properties. Um, and then um, chloric restriction is a big one. And so what's interesting about resveratrol is it's a chemical that gives similar results as a caloric restricted diet does. It activates certain genes involved with that. Supplementation with it is not has not yet proved to be that useful uh, that I can that I know of. So I'm just curious to see where the research goes with resveratrol. Drinking wine, you are getting some resveratrol in your in your diet for having wine. The problem is you have to basically be an alcoholic to get enough resveratrol to have this longevity promoting effect. Uh, but then you'd probably die of like fatty liver disease or liver cancer before uh, getting the benefits of the longevity. So it's an interesting compound. There's some neat research going in there. Um, who knows? Maybe in the future I'll take a resveratrol supplement. For now, I'm kind of waiting to see uh, how the results sort of go. Um, Likely you're getting some benefit from having a little bit of red wine or eating some blueberries. Even peanuts have small amounts, not really that significant, but it's found in lots of different things. So anti-aging is neat research there. Another thing about red veritrol is it possesses some phytoestrogenic effects. So when people are like complaining about the phytoestrogens of soy, you better stop drinking wine as well, okay? And some of the benefits of red wine might be that it, even though the alcohol increases the risk of breast cancer, the phytoestrogens in it and some of the anthocyanins could decrease the risk of breast cancer. So it's all dose dependent, okay? So I think the take home for stilbenoids is as the active antioxidant in the red wine, it possesses phytoestrogenic effects and it possesses possibly some anti-aging effects. Now, whether it's clinically significant or not, we'll find out. So here's a good slide to end on. Uh, the flavonoids and flavanols, or the flavonoids in general, is a big group of compounds we're going to talk about. So we'll take uh, a 10 minute break, come back at 10.50, and we'll go from here, okay? If you have any questions, just write them down. We'll answer them when we come back.
Uh, before we get started, this is with one of the articles I was reading. Uh, I just found the, uh, the newspaper version of it, and it was uh, a little hamlet in Italy called Acciaroli. And so apparently, the girl was married and take time as well. Um, and they eat, and they're talking about how they've got a bunch of people who are healthy and old and Again, it's probably not just the rosemary, but it's, uh, you know, it's good enough for these guys. I'll eat some, so. Oh, the other thing I was going to say about resveratrol are the stilbenoids. So resveratrol is the most uh, well-known uh, stilbenoid. <laughs> There's another stilbenoid that uh, one of the supplement companies sells this patented product that they've done a bunch of research and they're, uh, in Europe, it's used by for uh, primarily for menopausal hot flashes, and so I generally um, we've carried that product for people as one option for them for hot flashes, <clears throat> and it seems to work for some people. Nothing works for a hundred percent, so it seems to work for a bunch of people and not for other people. Resveratrol, uh, like this other stilbenoid have similar structures, they both phytoestrogens. And um, the other product, I don't know what the chemical name of it is, it's, it's nothing easy to remember, but it comes from a uh, type of uh, rhubarb root. Um, anyways, it's tested and well-established to be safe and effective for hot flashes. And again, stilbenoids take home as phytoestrogenic properties, okay? so. Now we're going to talk about the flavonoids. So, as I mentioned before, stilbenoids and flavonoids are very similar, but structurally they take on a different form just because of that bridge structure they have, okay? With flavonoids, flavonoids are polyphenols, and they're basically classified based on how the uh, third ring structure, where it's attached, and whether or not there are alcohol or ketone groups, okay? So the first structure is a flavone. There's a ketone group at the four position. Here we've got an isoflavone where you've got a ketone group there, but the iso refers to the placement of the third ring. Flavonols contain both a ketone and an alcohol. So just as an aside, ketones chemically, uh, Compounds that contain a ketone or as a dominant ketone will end in own, so ketone, and alcohols will end in ol, alls. So a flavonol will have a ketone and an alcohol. A flavonol, so A is for the absent of, and then all is there's an alcohol, so there's an absent ketone and an alcohol. And then the anthocyanidins are. Uh, not a true flavonoid because they don't have that ketone group there, but what they basically have is a different type of ring structure that allows them to um, 
polymerize and do some other things. So that's a quick little summary there. So there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different flavonoids that exist, especially as glycosides, okay? And the difference is between them is where they have an OH group, whether they have a methyl group stuck on here, uh, and a whole bunch of varieties. The take home here is you eat fruits and vegetables, you're going to be getting lots of these compounds, okay? Now, flavonoids are really important for health. And I would say that anyone eating a whole foods, plant-based diet is going to have a diet abundant in these uh, flav uh, and various flavonoids. And when you look at something like the Mediterranean diet, or okay, let's start with cholesterol drugs. If you take a cholesterol-lowering medication, it'll lower your risk, relative risk of having a heart attack by about 30%, okay? Uh, so that's relative risk reduction is about 30% for a statin drug. When you look at the uh, Mediterranean diet, it lowers your, if you switch to that, it'll lower your risk of having a heart attack by about 30% as well, okay? So the cholesterol-lowering drugs and the Mediterranean diet have similar relative risk reductions for preventing heart attacks, which is pretty neat, okay? When you look at um, a diet that is rich in flavonoids, and so I think the Mediterranean diet does have a lot of flavonoids, but I think we can do better, like by choosing certain particular foods that are even richer in these compounds that we want. And so in this one particular study in 2015, they took a thousand women over 75 years old. So, you know, when you're 75 years old, your risk of dying in the next five years is way higher than it is if you're 25 years old, right? So this is a good group of people to test because this is, you know, your dietary choices at 75 are really, really important compared to your dietary choices when you're 25. I mean, I think the diet's always important, but... From a dying standpoint, if you eat McDonald's for five years straight when you're 25, you're not probably going to die. You're not going to do very well, but you're not going to die. If you did that when you're 75, you probably will die pretty quickly. You know, that's just what happens with aging, okay? So with this group of women, um, their risk of dying is about 12%. And what they found is that they ate a diet that was rich in various flavonoids from teas and chocolate and berries and whatever it is. What they found is that it lowered their relative risk reduction was about 63%. So that's twice as good as the Mediterranean diet and the um, cholesterol lowering drugs do. What that means is that if you take 63% reduction on 12%, that means an absolute risk reduction of 7.6%. And what that means is for every 23 women that adopted a high flavonoid diet, one person does not have a heart attack who did that, who, who took that. Versus a cholesterol lowering drug for the same group would probably be about 1 in 40, 1 in 46 or so. So the take home for this <clears throat> is I think we can always do better than, med than the Mediterranean diet, you know. And we can certainly do better than the standard American diet. There's no doubt about that. And so this is why looking at, you know, there's lots of these epidemiological studies where they look at like groups of people and they're living longer. But let's say... If you follow a Mediterranean itch diet and you lower your meat even more and maybe lower your pasta a little bit more and have some more sweet potatoes and drink, make sure you get the rosemary in there, make sure you're eating lots of berries, make sure you eat the walnuts, make sure you have some legumes. We might be able to do even better than 63%. And I remember one study I looked at, a uh, whole foods plant based diet may lower the risk by as much as 80 some percent, which is pretty cool. Um, so, the problem is, is there's way more studies done on a uh, Mediterranean diet than a whole foods plant-based diet or a flavonoid versus diet. So I, I'm only choosing a couple studies here, but there's one pretty significant uh, study. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so even if you're eating meat, if you just eat some more chocolate and do olive oil and all these other things, you could do pretty good. Uh, any thoughts on that? You guys want to say what? Well, that's kind of cool. <laughs> now, when we're looking at just one particular food. Um, here they found that they took a bunch of people drinking green tea in Japan. I can't remember when I did this. And they were drinking five cups a day. So when you're drinking green tea, you're getting 
uh, ECGC, you're getting other flavonoids, you're getting a bunch of stuff in it. And so when you're drinking a lot of tea, it's just one food in high amounts, it'll lower your risk by about 13%. So appreciate when I go back to this, 63% from a whole bunch of flavonoids. This is only one thing, and you're drinking a whole bunch of just one thing that we know is good for you. Green tea alone doesn't do that much, relatively speaking, right? So, you know, if someone's like East McDonald's and says, oh, your green tea is good for me, and all they do is drink green tea, they're not going to do that well only with the green tea. But if you're doing chocolate and green tea and berries and walnuts and all these things, is good. So relative risk reduction just from the tea alone is about 15%. So to get up to that 60 or 80% risk reduction, you got to start stacking it on other things because there is diminishing returns. You know, once you get over five cups a day, your benefits aren't going down that much more. Okay. You don't need to know all these stats, but it's, uh, it's, it's just useful stuff. So the first group, group of polyphenols we're going to talk about are flavones. Flavones, um, are found in lots of things you're probably already eating. So when you look at various flavones, um, dietary sources, so when you eat celery, apigenin is an awesome phytochemical found in celery. You can't buy it as a supplement. Apigenin has properties against prostate cancer. Uh, it might have a bit of a sedative calming effect. It might, um, a lot of these flavonoids also have calming effects. And so generally speaking, um, eating more vegetables can be just have like a mild calming effect on people. I mean, this is what Buddhists and, and Hindus and yogis and stuff have been saying for years, you know, how your diet impacts your mood and can make you more relaxed and calm and, and uh, maybe eating more meat makes people less relaxed. Maybe it makes them more violent. I don't know. Perhaps. Um, we also know that apigenin has antispasmodic effects. And so it, in addition to uh, essential oils targeting smooth muscles, these things seem to have some relaxing effect on smooth muscles as well. And flavonoids, they're too big to evaporate. These will not be found in, in any kind of aromatic oil, okay? Um, so it can help with an anxiolytic, have some that common effect, cancer, um, anti-diabetic effect. So we know that, for example, eating uh, vegetables is good for preventing diabetes, but maybe this, not just the fiber, but specific chemicals that are in vegetables that do it. Um, and also cholesterol lowering effects. So celery, which I always thought was just crunchy water, you know, I always thought it was kind of useless because there aren't that many vitamins and minerals, but it's got some really good phytochemicals, phthalides as well, we'll talk about later on. So it lowers blood pressure, it may help with cholesterol, it may improve erections, it may help with um, prostate cancer. Some they can eat mm, celery every day is not a bad thing. And there's essential oils in it that have some benefits for arthritis uh, and some other properties, okay? So celery is awesome. And the other cool thing about celery is it doesn't have any calories, essentially. So uh, it's a non-starchy vegetable. So getting eating more of this is good for a million reasons. So that's one. Uh, chamomile tea is another. If you don't like celery, drink chamomile tea daily because it has a lot of the same phytochemicals plus other ones. And chamomile tea has been shown to help with women reduce the risk of heart disease. It can help with uh, anxiety. There's all sorts of awesome things. So... Um, I'm a big fan of chamomile tea. We, I try to drink it regularly, chamomile and peppermint tea. Um, other important flavonoids or flavones are the ones that are found in citrus. Nerogen and hesperidin are found in citrus, and citrus flavonoids have been shown to help with um, colitis. Now, there's one supplement manufacturer, uh, uh, I guess a supplement manufacturer, doing research on colitis with citrus flavonoids. Something like lemon juice, where if you grind up the entire lemon with the rind, it's going to be loaded with flavonoids and some other essential oils and stuff uh, that have all sorts of anti-cancer and antioxidant properties associated with these guys and the fiber and other things in it. Uh, Chinese skullcap has another important uh, flavone that's been shown to inhibit multidrug resistant pumps. And I suspect that in addition to, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, Baycalin, if that compound there is, is, you find the same thing from eating fruits and vegetables in general, I bet you a vegetarian is less likely to get antibody drug resistance going on in their body compared to a McDonald's eater, which is basically a void of 
phytochemicals, except for maybe the sesame seeds and that uh, small piece of iceberg lettuce might have a little bit, but. Uh, what's Ben saying? Do you know if celery root or celery seed have the same benefit? I think celery seed will probably have more essential oils in it and the root will have some other compounds, but they both have, they both have stuff, it's just you're gonna get slightly different phytochemicals or concentrations of those phytochemicals in the seed than over the root. Um, so eating the stalk or eating the root or eating the seeds, like you can't eat 100 grams of celery seed without getting some side effects, right? But, um, and usually they make tinctures out of celery seed. So, but it will have these compounds that be a little bit more concentrated, less fiber in the seeds, more of these other things, okay? Now, luteolin, which is uh, one of the compounds in uh, celery, you don't even know this, but it illustrates there's at least five different places where luteolin appears to, or wait, five, one, two, three places that luteolin appears to target uh, various things in your body to exert some positive anti-cancer effects. So it's affecting these apoptotic genes here, uh, this P50 gene attached to this thing, which I don't know anything about this. I never took this in biochemistry. I don't even think this knowledge existed when I was in university. Uh, this PKC uh, enzyme, it targets that one. It helps scavenge free radicals. So the take home here is polyphenols and antioxidants, yes, they scavenge free radicals, but the anti-cancer effects and the effects on heart disease and everything else, I think it's going, I think the free radical effects is only a very small part of it. You know, So to say something's an antioxidant, to me, I'm like, yeah, that doesn't mean anything. Everything is an antioxidant these days, but I think there are specific things that it targets that goes beyond that, okay? So vitamin C is an antioxidant, but it doesn't do these same things as far as I know, okay? So with oranges and grapefruit, hesperitin, narigen, and these are important flavones. And then again, the take home here is the ketone at the four position. And oops, see the flavones, that's the difference here, is what makes it, oops, sorry, makes it important. These guys have other health benefits. And I think all of these flavones and all the flavonoids in general will have benefits for heart disease and cancer and stuff like that. But maybe some of these will have more specific actions. I, I like getting a variety of things. I had orange and grapefruit this morning. The sugar in it's not great though, but, um, I like to mix up my my flavonoids and flavones and stuff in my diet. So here's Chinese skull cap, and this is that source of that flavonoid we talked, the flavone we talked about, the gallon, I think it's called, I don't know, I keep calling call it different. I should maybe look it up and see how I can pronounce it. Um, so what I like about this compound here is it's in Chinese skull cap, which is a herb often found in Chinese formulas involving inflammation and uh, infections. And we know that it appears to have a synergistic effect with a number of different antibiotics, including tetracycline, penicillin, cipro, gentamicin. I think one of the benefits of herbal medicine in the future will be uh, when there's a lot more drug resistance that goes on, and we're not able to create any more antibiotics. If we were to take, let's say, penicillin that works for strep throat and combine it with Chinese skullcap, we might have an effective drug again that may otherwise not be effective. You know, that's kind of what I'm thinking. And here's a whole bunch of studies to support that, just so you need to know any of that. So we talked about the flavones. Now we're going to talk, talk about the flavonols. So when you know that vo for the ketone, all for the alcohol. Okay. So in this case, you've got Ketone at four, alcohol at three. I would never ask, just in case you're wondering, I would never ask you a question like, say, flavones have a, have a ketone at the one position or the two position or the three position or the four position. I wouldn't ask you that, but I do want you to know alcohol and ketone, there might be one question on it, something like that, okay? Quercetin is one of the few basically uh, flavonoids available in supplement form, and I do use it sometimes as a supplement. Um, there are also some products that will have a mixture of, of these things in isolation, but quercetin is 
the only one that I know of that I, at least I've seen that's available in like a pure form. So just so you know, flavus in Latin means yellow, yellow. And so these flavanols tend to be yellow in color. And if you look at this onion on the left, that yellow color you see in the onion is going to be associated with quercetin. Presumably, I mean, I could be wrong, but that's what I'm thinking. And so you find that it's one of the most ubiquitous, meaning found everywhere, flavanols. And so onions will have it. Citrus have other things in it, but they also have some, going to have some quercetin in it. Vegetables in general, even green tea, when you're drinking tea, it's going to have quercetin in it. And so the main active compounds of green tea are other compounds beyond just quercetin, but quercetin is important too. And so again, drinking green tea, you're not just getting ECGC, you're getting the quercetin as well, and some other, you know, a little bit of chlorophyll and whatever else. So for me, um, I use this, the only thing I really use this in practice for is an antihistamine. So with people coming with seasonal allergies, I'll get the vitamin C and quercetin combination uh, as to take to reduce or as a substitute for antihistamine medication. It's not nearly as powerful, but when you change the diet, so as an aside, I'm treating uh, seasonal allergies. Uh, I also get them re to remove common food sensitivities because if, if they have a dairy or an egg sensitivity and they're eating a lot of that, it increases inflammation through a different immune reaction that can release cytokines that can amplify their uh, seasonal allergies. So it's not that the seasonal allergies are caused by eating eggs, but all of that stimulated immune system can increase the inflammatory response going on with, with seasonal allergies. So the best way to get rid of a cat allergy is to remove the cat, but if you can't do that, um, remove the dairy and the eggs and eat some, you know, take a supplement with vitamin C and quercetin, and it can help. It's not going to get rid of it as well as getting rid of the cat, but it will help, okay? Maybe 50% or more reduction. Um, and remember, all these flavonoids that we talked about could exist as glycosides. So quercetin is the a glycone meaning no uh, sugar attached but you've got rutin is one of probably hundreds of different glycosides of quercetin that exists okay uh i don't remember putting this in but i think it just basically says onions are good for you and you know what when i buy onions i buy purple onions because not only are you getting the yellow quercetin you're probably also going to be getting anthocyanin that's another type of flavonoid, not a true flavonoid, but flavonoid-like structure. Uh, so when we talked earlier about soy being a phytoestrogen, the phytoestrogens in it are isoflavones. Isoflavones like genistein and didazine are the two uh, isoflavones in, um, in um, uh, soy. Now, oh, I didn't show the picture. The take home here is flav, flavones have the ketone at the four position. They don't have that alcohol group at the three position because that third ring structure has been shifted from two to three. And by doing that, it's going to affect its three dimensional conformation. So it's going to have a different uh, structure in 3D space. Even though it doesn't look that different if it's a two position, it's likely going to now kind of move around inside certain receptors like estrogen receptors and be able to pull it whatever is needed to activate or modulate those receptors, okay? So isoflavones are found in lots of different things, uh, especially members of the legume family, the Fabiaceae family, which includes soy, but red clover. Um, you can buy a red clover supplement called uh, Promensol, which is an extract of red clover that contains high amounts of genistein and diazine. It's made by a drug company. Uh, you can buy it at you know, discount uh, grocery stores and stuff sometimes. Um, and it's got a lot of really good research showing benefit for preventing menopausal hot flashes, also for possibly building bone and 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 uh, preventing uh, breast and uterine cancer and stuff. Um, so it's the same compounds as in soy, I mean, no surprise, they're both in the Fabiaceae family, soy and red clover, they both express the same phytochemicals. 
For food, you eat soy. For a supplement, you go more as a red clover. You can also do red clover as a, as a tincture as well, but there are coumarins and other things that, that uh, exert some other effects. Licorice um, is a really important herb in Chinese medicine. As I mentioned earlier, it has glycerizin in it, which is an important uh, thing that can elevate blood pressure, um, has some adrenal tonifying effects. Um, but in addition to that, licorice contains some isoflavones. One of these is this isoflavane. So it doesn't have a ketone. Okay, so it's not really an isoflavone, it's an isoflavane. But this compound here is uh, something that I believe has some estrogenic properties associated with, with licorice. And so there's some classic Chinese formulas like peony and licorice that are used for things like uh, menstrual cramps and PCOS and stuff like that. Okay. So this one is just kind of an unusual uh, compound. It's not technically a polyphenol because you've only got one phenol group and this guy's been kind of bound up in another ring structure. You don't really have to even know this slide. I know it doesn't even show up on the exam, but I just like to sort of mention it that licorice has some interesting properties uh, beyond just that. And there are other flavonoids in licorice that exert an effect. Okay. So the isoflavones we talked about have the ketone here, and then the third ring structure is attached at number three, not number two. Now we're going to jump back to uh, when the ring structure is attached at this two position. And these are flavonols. Okay. Oh, wait. No, we did those. Flavonols, we already did those. Now we're going to go to, which ones are we doing? Flavonols. Okay. And this is where there is no ketone group here, and there's an alcohol group here. So these include uh, catechins, uh, epigallocatechin. These are important things in tea and chocolate. And catechin is one of the, probably the most widespread flavin, flavanols, okay? This is a flavin triol. So you've got the OH at the three position. Um, antioxidant, this has some, possibly some anti-cancer effects. One of the reasons why plants produce these compounds, I think, is because they can absorb UV radiation and act as a natural sunblock. And tea tends to grow at higher altitude, altitudes. And at higher altitudes, there's less ozone to filter out the sun's UV radiation, so uh, you're more likely to get sunburned. So that's probably one, one of the reasons why tea produces a lot of catagen. Chocolate also contains catagens. Now, green tea has other things, but chocolate has a lot of health benefits, partly because of these catagens in it, and epicatagens, okay? Uh, uh, so here's an interesting study I found where green tea consumption was significantly inversely associated with cardiovascular disease and, and all-cause mortality, whereas black tea consumption was significantly inversely associated with all-cause cancer and all-cause mortality. So drinking more tea is good for you, basically, is what they're saying, okay? There's a compound in green tea, and this is a kind of a hybrid. It's part catagen, part uh, uh, tannin, so to speak. So it's, you've got that gallic acid molecule, which is one of those uh, uh, simple phenolic acids attached to uh, epigallocatechin. Okay, so this compound is called EGCG. And you'll find lots of research on this in white and green tea. I think the brewing and ferment, fermentation, sorry, the fermentation process of black tea uh, removes almost all of this, probably not all, but almost all of it. And so this appears to have some anti antioxidant effects, um, anti-cancer effects probably, but it's also been used in supplements and studies for chronic fatigue syndrome, HIV, endometriosis, and some other studies. So I don't think I've ever given to anyone uh, in pure form like I have with quercetin. Maybe I should. Um, but again, green tea will have this compound in it. It'll have um, quercetin. It'll have catechin alone, uh, epigallocatechin alone. So lots of different things. Um, 
I think drinking some green tea periodically is a good thing. I think eating chocolate's a good thing. I think drinking coffee is a good thing. I think eating berries is a good thing. The fake home is trying a little bit of all of these things. I mean, that's what I think is the secret to uh, eating healthy. Uh, that one. So here's a study that showed green tea didn't show any association with mortality, meaning it didn't actually help with cancer. And that's why I put that question mark on the cancer, because I always thought green tea was supposed to be like this amazing thing for cancer. But it may not be as good. I still think it's good to eat, lowers your risk by, what, 13% to have in this study, it looks like, in this group of people, um, for heavy tea drinkers. But So again, epigallocanogen, it's a hybrid between the EGC, the epigallic acid, and this gallic acid molecule, okay? So it's like a centaur, half gallic acid, half EGC. Now, the last group of compounds we're going to talk about are the anthocyanidins, okay? Again, these are kind of a subcategory of flavanols, but they've got more double bonds on that central ring structure, and the significance of that is that these often will form polymers as well, okay? So when you have all of these conjugated bonds, remember when we're talking about blue, uh, uh, lycopene, uh, beta carotene, so the carotenoids, and what gives them those colors is when you have double bond space, double bond space, double bond space, and the length of those what are called conjugated bonds will determine what wavelength of light they emit to give that nice reflective color that we love so much in fruits and vegetables. And so not all flavonoids produce those colors. Now, quercetin has uh, a system that because of the ketone presentation, it still has the conjugated bonds and you can get that and probably it absorbs and reflects light so you get that yellow color. Um, the blues and purples are gonna be a different color they're going to be emitting different wavelengths of light. And that's associated with these anthocyanidins. And you can actually change the color but based on the acidity of the solution you have these things in. So with flavanols, when they lack the ketone and they have got these little double bonds along here, it creates a positive charge on there. And they often exist as glycosides. When you add sugar to an anthocyanidin, you produce an anthocyanin, okay? So the anthocyanins are the glycosides of the anthocyanidins, okay? And when you look at something like grape juice, these compounds, which are only sparingly soluble in water, they are soluble, they are you know, not 100%. Because of the presence of the glycosides, you're gonna get even more of them dissolving in water. And if you look at uh, grape juice, it's like, really purple and that you know especially concord grapes that beautiful purple color is going to be related to all these compounds so berries uh like blueberries and cranberries uh, are going to be loaded with them elderberries even red cabbage is going to have more health benefits than just eating white cabbage because of the presence of these anthocyanins cherries eggplant it's kind of like a giant blueberry you know with very little sugar which is good and then apples as well so again, reds and purples. Now, there's some nice red cabbage there. So if you're gonna make coleslaw, make it out of red cabbage, not white cabbage. Just, you're just getting more health benefits. So like any or like any polyphenol, antioxidant, any inflammatory, anti-cancer, some of these guys will have an anti-adherence effect. And I've even been reading anti-adherence, meaning they may prevent the binding of certain bacteria or viruses to our mucous membrane. So the benefits of drinking cranberry juice, which also extends to blueberries, is that there are anthocyanins and probably some carbohydrates that stick to the feet. Have a picture of this? Yeah. Stick to the feet of bacteria and prevent them from adhering to our mucous membranes, okay? So one of the reasons why cranberry juice is good is because of these anthocyanins. Prebiotic. Some herbs, like elderflowers, are used to prevent colds and flus. And one of the ways that they may work is because they prevent the binding of um, viruses to our mucous membranes when we drink it. 
And the second reason is that I think some of these compounds are metabolized by our gut bacteria and exert some immunomodulating effects uh, through that. So the polyphenols, I think they, they help to feed certain bacteria and encourage their growth as well. So no surprise there, eating lots of purple and blue things, heart disease, diabetes, cancers, they may have some blood sugar regulating effects to help with obesity, may help with certain types of infections like urinary tract infections with the cranberry or elderflower for flu and upper respiratory tract infections. Gut health, because they can feed your gut and, and exert things there, modulate immune function. So there are a million reasons why eating more of these Maybe not a million, but there's at least 10 reasons or six reasons or eight reasons why you should be eating more of these things, okay? Uh, this is one that I found about how eating tart cherries, polyphenols from that, and other things from blueberries actually modulate your gut flora and support the growth of certain good bacteria and reduce the growth of bad bacteria. So, you know, if you get a lot of infections, eat your fruits and vegetables, right? Uh, so unlike the other flavonoids and flavanols that we talked about, these guys can generate that positive charge on the central ring and they can form polymers. So if you stack a whole bunch of these together, you get a compound called an illegal merit proanthocyanidin. And I'm pretty sure that when you have like a bottle of wine that's really old and you get the, uh, the residue in the bottom, it's probably some of these, um, uh, anthocyanidins are forming polymers with each other and then precipitating out a solution. That's kind of what I think is going on there. I could be wrong, but because uh, it may be less soluble. So the take home here is illegal merit proanthocyanidins are polymers of these anthocyanidins. Okay. Now, another, a fun little thing just so you're aware of, as you probably know, blueberries are um, blue and cranberries are red. So blue and purple uh, berries, if you took a pH litmus test of, the, of it, it's gonna be more alkaline, a little bit more neutral, like a pH of let's say, I don't know if it's seven or what it is precisely, but it's more neutral. Well, cranberry juice tends to be more acidic. And if you take blueberry juice, and you add acid to it, the blueberry juice turns red. And if you add baking soda and alkalinize it, it tends to turn more on this end of the spectrum. So what's interesting is these anthocyanins, the more protons you add to it, it changes the color, or removing them changes the color to make it either yellow or red, depending on the acidity. So this is that litmus paper. You can actually literally use these on a piece of paper to measure the acidity of solution, which is kind of cool. So blueberries and cranberries, the juices have a lot of the same health benefits, just, and they have the same, very similar phytochemicals that not identical in some cases, but the color difference is related to uh, the, the acid. Blood oranges, you're getting all those good flavonoids that we talked about earlier on, plus you're getting some anthocyanins in it. Uh, red apples are better for you than uh, green apples because you get more of the anthocyanins and anthocyanins in it, okay? So if you have the choice, eat a red apple, especially if you want the healthiest red apple, it's the red and delicious, which is my least favorite type of apple, but you know, that bright red in there, uh, you've got more of the phytochemicals that you want. Um, you know if there's any difference in the chemical makeup of wild blueberries versus not wild blueberries? I've seen lots of articles suggesting wild blueberries have more health benefits. Um, often wild fruit have higher concentrations and, and uh, uh, they're gonna be similar, but probably a higher concentration of things that are good for you. Certainly if you look at a wild versus a cultivated blueberry, um, they're, they seem to be less, they're smaller and more purple in color, and the flesh on the inside is more purple compared to, I find sometimes with the cultivated blueberries, uh, you bite into them and they, they almost look kind of white, whiter on the inside, and there's less blue through them, but I don't know precisely how much. So the next group of polyphenols we're talking about are tannins. 
So we're done with the flavonoids, kind of. So we talked about two types of tannins already, and I'm going to go through and explain the difference. Uh, and then that's a good question. So if you peel the apple, would you lose all the anthocyanidins? Well, it depends. If you peel the if you peel the apple and you threw away the peel, then you're basically getting sugar water, and that's what apple juice. Why apple juice is just so concentrated with sugar? You don't get the phytochemicals in it. If you peel the apple and ate ate the peel, then you're not only are you getting the anthocyanidins, but you're going to be getting the pectin and all these other things. So if, when it comes to an apple, the healthiest part of it. Not from a macronutrient standpoint, but from a phytochemical standpoint, the healthiest part of an apple is the peel, not not the uh, not the actual fruit meat itself. The meat's it's got a lot of sugar in it, um, and it doesn't have a lot of phytochemicals. Um, however, the peel is more likely to have the pesticide residues on it as well. But I'd rather personally, I'd rather go with eat the pesticides and get the phytochemicals than peel it and just get all the sugar and get diabetes. So. Increase my risk of cancer that maybe the phytochemicals can help to reduce or go with the, uh, the, uh, the just the juice. So with plant tannins, there are two main types of plant tannins. We talked about both already. There's hydrolyzable and condensed tannins. So what tannins do is when you put them in your mouth, they react with your mucous membranes and they create an astringent effect in your mouth where your mouth puckers up. Just like when you eat a green banana, your mouth goes puckery. And so tannins have that effect because they form a cross linkage with proteins on the surface of your mucous membranes uh, and they tighten up the skin and pull it together. Okay, where the mucous membranes pull it together. So tannins are used to tan animal hides. So you add astringent things to, uh, to uh, an animal hide, which is very flexible and, and, and uh, delicate. And then when you add tannins to it, it forms a cross link. And then you make leather, which is a pretty kind of like a tough armor in a way. You know, leather jackets are pretty tough and can protect you when you're riding a motorbike and stuff like that. Uh, versus going, you know, shirtless on a motorbike would be very unwise. Okay. So tannins in small amounts in your diet are really good for you. In high amounts, they can drastically alter your mucous membranes and cause structural changes to your tissues. So if you cut yourself, let's say you were on the motorbike and you didn't wear your leather jacket and you fell off and you cut up your arm and you were bleeding profusely, if you added tannins to your skin, it would turn it leather-like. And the benefit of that is it forms cross-linkage with those exposed tissues that have been traumatized by the cuts and whatever and it can tighten them up to stop bleeding and create a second layer of skin that can help prevent infections as well. So that astringent action has a hemostatic effect. And once you've sealed up the skin, it can also uh, prevent secondary infections or it can bind to uh, bacteria and clog up their feet so they can't attach to you. So it can actually inactivate certain bacteria or, back or viruses as well. Uh, if you take it internally, when you have, let's say, Traveler's diarrhea. Green bananas are a home remedy in the tropics for diarrhea because those tannins affect not just your mucous membrane, but they bind to some of these proteins, uh, uh, protein exotoxins that are released by some of these bacteria, and thereby uh, neutralize those and can help with diarrhea. So tannins are good, but you don't want to overdo it. So they can affect nutrient absorption. If you start tanning your insides, um, then the transporters, which are protein-based that contain nitrogen, they'll be inactivated. Uh, so it decreases stomach acid and it can decrease absorption. Plus, it can directly bind to uh, minerals that you're eating and some other things. I just turned off my web camera there because apparently the connection was slowing down. Um, so it can, it can affect nutrient absorption and then high amounts can be toxic, you know. Squirrels eat a lot of acorns that are very, very stringent, but they have their own ways of detoxifying. You know, just like salicylic acid, uh, yeah, small amounts can be good for inflammation. High amounts is going to be toxic, cause problems. Okay. Uh, so tannins, as Ben's question here, is 
Tannins are sometimes used for skin toners as an astringent um, that can be used to tighten up the skin to help with wrinkles. That's one of the thoughts of it. Also, men that are shaving, if they cut themselves, they'll use uh, something called a styptic stick, which is a stringent compound. Usually it's like a, it's actually a chemical stringent agent, like aluminum hydroxide or something, uh, that they apply topically to uh, to the, to the uh, cut to stop it from bleeding, okay? So hydrolyzable tannins are glycosides. And remember, a glycoside is hydrolyzed with acids or enzymes. And so hydrolyzable tannins are basically made up of tannic acid or elagic acid with a bunch of sugars attached to it. So elagic acid, remember that's a pomegranate juice. So uh, panicalin is from, from pomegranates, tannic acids, and tea. And those are both astringent. So remember black tea, um, a lot of people add milk to it because it helps to bind up the tannins and make it less astringent. And if you didn't do that, those tannins might pucker up your mouth and affect you know, your digestion. Um, classic herbs you use as astringents would be witch hazel and oak, usually used topically, but you could use it internally. Uh, also, food things like pomegranate and tea have these hydrolyzable tannins as well. So this big tumor-like structure on this oak tree is called uh, a gall, okay, G-A-R-L. And there's basically a strategy that plants use if they become infected with something, they try to wall it off, they dump high amounts of um, hydrolyzable tannins in it uh, to fight off the infection or the invader or whatever it is. So gallic acid is concentrated as a hydrolyzable tannin in high amounts in this gall. Elagic acid, from pomegranate juice, it will have some sugars attached to it. This is where it comes from as well. We've already mentioned both these before. Condensed tannins, you've got, um, uh, these are the, uh, the if you eat a blueberry, so take blueberries on hot water, your frozen blueberries and drink the water, you'll notice there's a slight astringency to it. And it's not as strong as the hydrolyzable ones, in my opinion, but can still be pretty significant. And so, Herbs like blueberries and cranberries have that stringent property, so it can have that. So it's cranberries for urinary tract infection, it does have a slight urinary astringent effect to it. Bilberry, which is like a northern European blueberry, it's got a lot more of these condensed tannins in it. It's much more stringent than our class of blueberries. Uh, but also elderberries and grapes have some. Remember, if you drink like a strong... Grand Reserve Rioja or a Cabernet Sauvignon that's been stored in oak barrels. The oak contains the hydrolyzable tannins and then the grapes themselves will have the condensed tannins. And so a strong oaky wine is very astringent. And that's why people usually eat those with heavy uh, steak and meats because the tannins will help to bind up protein in it and not irritate the stomach. If you drink a really oaky red wine on the stomach, you probably will get a little bit of gut rot from it, and that's from the tannins, okay? So that's why, generally speaking, people don't drink a lot of red wine on the stomach. While you might have a little bit of white wine with a little bit of you know crackers before a meal or have a beer before a meal, then you go with the heavy oaky red wine with a big steak meal, which um, is delicious, but you know that steak's not good for you. They still do it. Um, so, condensed tannins, hydrolyzable tannins. The reason why it's hydrolyzable is because you can use acid or heat to break it down or enzyme reactions. So, another group of polyphenols we'll talk about are lignans and, and flavonolignans. Okay? Lignans. Um, The classic lignin is uh, the ones you find in flaxseed, and that's the main dietary one. Flaxseed, also sesame seeds, you'll find these in other things as well, but those, uh, they are in things like Siberian ginseng, have some lignins in it, some other herbs as well. But from a dietary standpoint, uh, lignins are basically made from taking uh, two phenylpropanide groups and sticking them kind of end to end. And most lignins, um, get metabolized by your gut bacteria. And so here's what you have 
here's a glycosine sign of the lignin you find in flax. The sugars get chewed off in your gut. It forms another kind of aglycone component. It gets oxidized by your gut bacteria and produces what are called mammalian lignans. So these are the ones that we find, primary ones that we find circulating in your blood after we eat flaxseed. And you couldn't do it without the presence of your gut bacteria, okay? So appreciate it. The phytochemicals that we consume um, are altered by gut bacteria and altered by our livers and exert different effects once that occurs. Another thing I'll just mention as a side note is lignins, where it's basically L-I-G-N-A-N, is not to be confused with lignins, which has I-N. Lignins give one of the things that gives what its structural integrity to it, okay? Um, and they are derived from phthalopropanoids, but you can't eat wood and get the benefits of the lignans in that form. Lignans, not lignans. Okay. Now, other herbs, including burdock. Burdock it's, contains a compound called arcogenin, and burdock is a classic herb used in in, uh, in uh, herbal medicine for a whole bunch of different things. In particular, it's used as a skin cleanser. It's used as an alternative, so it's, it helps with skin conditions like acne and psoriasis. Um, it also appears to have some uh, anti-cancer properties that's used in some of the classic, uh, 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 what's it called? Benziac is a controversial anti-cancer herbal remedy from Muskoka region. Um, it has burdock root in it. It's also used, burdock's used as a food in Japan called gobo, where there's inulin in it, which is a carb prebiotic carbohydrate, but then there's also these interesting flavonoids in it, and it'll have some sesquiterpenes, lactones, I'm sure, in it as well. But this seems to have some anti, some, um, sorry, um, uh, phytoestrogenic effects. It may help inhibit some drug-resistant pump inhibitors, or it may act as a drug-resistant pump inhibitor. Um, so lots of neat stuff in here. You don't really have to know anything about it. But when you learn about burdock, just remember some of the health benefits is associated with these uh, uh, phenylpropanoid derivatives, these lignans. Now, flavonol lignin, if you remember way back when we were talking about the first lecture with the synergy of berberine and uh, the 5-MHC, flavonol lignans can also act as multi-drug resistant pump inhibitors as well, okay? Now, Milk thistle is probably the classic herb that contains flavonol lignans, but barberry also does. I'm sure there's some other herbs, golden seal, Oregon grape, that have them. And so they don't have uh, the primary effects of them is, it, is it, uh, an antimicrobial, but as a secondary effect, they work synergistically with other compounds. So what you basically have with the flavonol lignin is you have one phenylpropanoid, which is kind of half a lignin, attached onto um, your flavanol, okay? Uh, uh, sorry, your flavanol. And so this compound down at the bottom here is an example of one. That should be flavonol, okay? Here's another one here where silly marn, you've got the alcohol and the ketone group and you kind of propanoid. So these two are slightly different, okay? One has the OH group, the other one doesn't. But interestingly enough, in addition to being good antioxidants, they both protect the liver. They both appear to have uh, inhibit drug resistance. Um, I know that silymar and silybenin, um, they're use, usually uh, research more for their benefits on the liver for helping with liver regeneration and protecting the liver. But there's a number of studies that show that taking silybenin may help reverse drug resistance when people are taking chemotherapies. And there's a whole bunch of studies. So the assumption that oncologists make that antioxidants should not be given with certain chemotherapeutic drugs might be false because even though it seems to make sense, clinical trials should be done to find out if it doesn't actually prevent drug resistance and reduce side effects, which I think they would. Okay? I can't be certain until they've done good clinical trials, but I'm pretty confident that they have that potential. Okay? Uh, and they've, certainly there's a bunch of studies not tons of human trials yet with it. <clears throat> so two more classes we're going to go through. These will be pretty quick. So coumarins are made by taking cinnamic acid 
and you basically uh, make a hydroxycyanic acid, it forms a little cyclization, so you get like a bicyclic compound, and it has two ring structures to it, and you get coumarin. Coumarin at the bottom is not technically a phenolic compound anymore, okay? It's a coumarin. But it was originally derived from a phenol compound. That's why it's in this category. There are lots of different varieties out there. These are all different coumarins that are found in herbs at the top. Sorolin is another one, uh, which is a type of coumarin. And then thalides are a cousin of coumarins. So coumarins in general, they are small molecules that are going to be found in essential oils. So they have that aromatic property. So when you smell a freshly mowed yard or grass, the smell is from the coumarin tent. And coumarins are also found in lots of herbs. Um, they have an antispasmodic effect, like a lot of essential oils are relaxing the muscles. Uh, they often, the herbs that contain coumarins are used as lymphatic, so they are used for uh, stagnation in the lymphatic tissues, so for edema, so anti-edema. Um, some of them will relax uh, blood vessels and exert an effect there. So you've got basically uh, red clover, which contains phytoestrogens, also has a lot of coumarin in it. And so traditional herbalists would use red clover for a spasmodic cough, for respir respiratory tract infections. Now, cinnamon, Chinese cinnamon, also has a lot of coumarin. It's not the desirable component necessarily in cinnamon. Uh, we know that coumarins and high amounts are bad for the liver, and there's some warnings out with people overdoing with cinnamon. So you got to watch that. Uh, other herbs, cranberry, bark, horse chestnut, One's used for menstrual cramps, the other one used for uh, edema, leg swelling. Uh, both have high amounts of coumarins. So a couple of concerns we have with this. Uh, watch them with blood thinners and watch them with the liver. Okay, And that will come up again when we talk about safety of herbs. There's cinnamon. There's yellow clover. There's cramp bark. Apparently, though, coumarin is toxic to the liver. But some of these coumarin derivatives where you've got these OH groups stuck on the uh, the main uh, uh, benzene ring there. Um, these don't seem to have the same hepatotoxicity as the other ones do, just as an aside. Ferranocoumarins are an interesting group of compounds. They are found in your diet, primarily in grapefruit, but you can also get them in other herbs. Rue is a spice used in some cultures. Also, some herbs that are in the uh, celery family, like wild parsnip and giant hogweed, contain high amounts of sorolin or uh, ferranocoumarins in general. So, two main concerns. I don't know of any medicinal benefits of it. Maybe there are, but the main thing that we have to worry about with these is uh, three issues of safety. One, the grapefruit juice effect, where if you take grapefruit juice with certain drugs like statin drugs for lowering cholesterol, it will elevate the drug levels. That's associated with uh, ferranocoumarins. The second thing is that if you get the resin topically on your skin, it can burn your skin when exposed to UV light. So sorolin is often applied topically to psoriasis to concentrate sunlight, but it increases the risk of sunburns and skin cancer. It can be quite dangerous. The final thing, not all ferranocoumarins are hepatotoxic, Aflatoxins are one group that this is a compound that uh, is released by molds, uh, in particular a fungus called Aspergillus that grows on uh, peanuts in the Philippines and, and Indonesia and Thailand, uh, but it can also probably grow on coffee, probably grow on grains, um, and what happens is if you consume this in high amounts, um, it gets metabolized by the liver and causes liver cancer. Now just as an aside, if you read about the China study, uh, they originally did their research finding that people eating alpha toxins, uh, some people were getting cancer who were exposed to these, and they found that rich people were getting it more than the poor people, and the poor people, the reason why they weren't getting liver cancer, they suspected was because they weren't eating meat. So it's weird that the alpha toxins are actually bad for you, especially, or only get reactivated in the presence of meat in your diet. So kind of a neat little thing there. Uh, as an aside, eating lots of vegetables like carrots and celery and other things that contain high amounts of uh, phthalides and other compounds and maybe flavonoids might protect from uh, liver cancer. Uh, and grapefruit juice, which is also a ferranocoumarin, appears to protect against 
the aflatoxins. And so probably the aflatoxins get activated in the liver and become more toxic uh, through the liver. Phthalides, not a whole lot of people about these. Here's a picture of our celery again. Remember how we had uh, epigenin and some other important flavonoids in there? Phthalides are found in celery, but also in other herbs like Don Kwai and Garden Angelica. They contain uh, some phthalides that may have beneficial effects on lowering blood pressure by uh, increasing blood flow to the pelvic region as a vasodilator. They may help protect against strokes. Um, so lots of interesting things. Beyond that, I don't have a whole lot to say about them. Celery lowers blood pressure. Don Kwai is used for menstrual issues. It's called a female ginseng, probably because it increases blood flow to the pelvic region. And Garden Angelica is used more of a rest as a uh, 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 for the respiratory tract infection to dilate the bronchioles and also for menstrual issues. And this is, I'm probably out of time. Yeah, but I'm going to do this one in three minutes and let you guys go. Quinones, naphthoquinones, and anthroquinones. So we talked about quinones already with the arbutin, jumping between quinone and hydroquinone. So you can go back to that slide. That's the simplest one, okay, the benzoquinone molecule. Next two we'll talk about are naphthoquinones and anthroquinones. So a naphthoquinone has a quinone molecule with a benzene ring attached. It's an important structure in your body. Two important uh, nutrients in your body are vitamin K and coenzyme Q10. Vitamin K uh, is used in uh, blood clots, also has positive effects for heart disease, atherosclerosis, a whole bunch of other things. CoQ10 is part of the electron transport chain where it donates and accepts electrons along that to kind of shuffle electrons along the electron transport chain. So the reason why I'm saying that is because potentially these naphthoquinones, I'd have a concern that could they affect bleeding in our body? And also if they're if CoQ10 is a naphthoquinone, maybe these guys could potentially disrupt the electron transport chain. And we know that naphthoquinones are important antimicrobials that kill bugs. Some of them will kill uh, worms, act as a vermifuge. And so taking these long term, I'd be concerned that they could uncouple the electron transport chain and increase free radicals. That might be good for fighting bugs, but long term, maybe we don't want to do that. Some of these compounds are used in uh, herbs that contain it, like uh, podarco, which is grows in South America, uh, is used for cancer. Um, so I, I, I use them, but only for short periods of time. They also have a red pigment associated with them. So henna, you know, in certain cultures, Middle Eastern and South Asian cultures, they paint henna on the hands for weddings or they put it in the hair as a hair dye. That's the naphthoquinones that do that. And so in addition to having antimicrobial effects, it can be used as a dye. Uh, like the naphthoquinones, they can easily accept and donate electrons, so there's that pro-oxidant, antioxidant effect. And then finally, there is some mild laxative effects I think are associated with these as well. One of the classic herbs used in Western herbalism is black walnut, and it's used primarily as a uh, anti-parasitic herb, okay? The hen I mentioned before contains another naphthoquinone for, um, as a dye. But hen is also used topically as an antifungal and turning as a herb in that culture as well. Uh, so there's a walnut tree growing on my parents' property. One of the things that you know about, or you might know about walnut trees, is that um, both the roots and the leaves and the husks release those naphthoquinones that are basically deter the growth of certain plants. So with my parents, their vegetable garden is right on the fringe of the black walnut, and periodically my dad has to go and dig up a little trench along the area and remove all the black walnut roots from that are kind of starting to infiltrate the garden because certain plants won't grow uh, if the roots kind of get into our garden. Um, and then finally, anthroquinones. These basically have uh, your quinone group and it's flanked on both sides by a benzene ring and they can exist as polymers. The most important thing is when you hear anthroquinone glycosides, you immediately think stimulating laxative. 
and Senna, which is available everywhere. It's the classic dip remedy, both by doctors and herbalists, for stimulating people's bowels, okay? Senna has it, rhubarb root, aloe vera, resin, not the gel, but the resin, which is a yellow latex on the inner uh, layer of the leaf, uh, has that effect, okay? So the take home here is it makes you poop, antimicrobial. As an aside, you'll also find these compounds and other things. St. John's wort has uh, an anthroquinone in it that acts as an antiviral as well. So there are some antimicrobial effects associated with these guys as well. Uh, I don't think it, uh, St. John's wort has an, uh, a laxative effect though, okay? Um, these guys can affect your electrolyte balance. That's not so important right now, but I will mention it again during the safety stuff later on. So here's Senna. The seeds and leaves, the seed pods and leaves are used, and there's uh, St. John's wort. If you ever look at St. John's wort oil, it's red in color, and both Senna and St. John's wort, the active compounds have that red color, not unlike the naphthoquinones you see in henna. Okay, so some of those yellowy red colors associated with these guys. Okay. Sorry, I went over five minutes here, but that's we got it all done. You guys have any questions before we wrap this up? So next week we'll continue along. We'll have part three will be the alkaloids. Uh, I think we're good. So I hope you guys have a wonderful week. If you have any questions, let me know and I'll post this slide. If you miss something, I'll be posting this in the next couple of days. Okay. Bye for now.